Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Bienvenidos. <laughs> Thanks for coming to mark this day of solidarity with the Cuban people. This is a day of pride as we honor the culture and history of a noble nation. It's a day of sorrow as we reflect on the continued oppression of the Cuban people. Most of all, this is a day of hope. We have hope because we see a day coming when Cubans will have the freedom of which they have dreamed for centuries. The freedom that is the eternal birthright of all mankind. And many of you here are working to hasten that day. And I thank you for your efforts. I particularly thank the members of my cabinet who've joined us. Madam Secretary, thank you for coming and being a staunch friend of the Cuban people. Mi, mi amigo Carlos Gutierrez. <laughs> y su familia. For those of you in Cuba who are listening to this broadcast, I think it is important for you to know that Carlos is a Cuban American. He's now in the cabinet of the President of the United States. All things are possible in a free society. Secretary Kempthorne, Secretary Chow, and Secretary Levitt, thank you all for coming as well. I appreciate Acting Secretary Bernardi of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Particularly thankful for members of the United States Congress, Mel Martinez, all things are possible in a free society. <laughs> Ileana Roslathian. <laughs> Los Hermanos Ballard. <laughs> Lincoln Diaz Ballard y también Mario Diaz Ballard. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Con Congressman Chris Smith. Congressman. Congressman Daryl Issa. <laughs> Congressman John Campbell. <laughs> Congressman Gus Bilarakis. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate, you all coming. Appreciate the members of the diplomatic corps who've joined us. Thank you for being such good friends of the Cuban people. I want to thank family members of the Cuban dissidents who are here. Welcome to the White House. Thank you for coming. <laughs> y por fin, Willy Chirino and his wife, Lisette Alvarez. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> this time of year holds great significance for the Cuban people. 113 years ago this week, Cuba lost its great poet and patriot, Jose Marti. And 106 years ago this week, Cuba achieved the independence for which Marti gave his life. Jose Marti knew that true liberty would come to Cuba only with a just government of its people's choosing. He warned a regime of personal despotism would even be more shameful and more calamitous than the political despotism Cuba now endures. Marti's warning proved truer than anyone could have imagined. Today, after nearly a 
half century of repression. Cuba still suffers under the personal despotism of Fidel and Raul Castro. On the dictators watch Cuba's political freedoms have been denied. Families have been torn apart. The island's economy has been reduced to shambles. Cuba's culture has been drained of artists and scholars and musicians and athletes. And like the once grand buildings of Havana, Cuba's society is crumbling after decades of neglect under the Castros. A few months ago, when Fidel handed over many of his titles to his brother Raul, the Cuban regime announced a series of so-called reforms. For example, Cubans are now allowed to purchase mobile phones and DVD players and computers. And they've been told that they will be able to purchase toasters and other basic appliances in 2010. If the Cuban regime is serious about improving life for the Cuban people, it will take steps uh, necessary to make these changes meaningful. Now, if the Cuban people can be trusted with mobile phones, they should be trusted to speak freely in public. Now that the Cuban people are allowed to purchase DVD players, they should also be allowed to watch movies and documentaries produced by Cuban artists who are free to express themselves. Now that the Cuban people have open access to computers, they should also have open access to the Internet. Now that the Cuban people will be allowed to have toasters in two years, they should stop needing to worry about whether they will have bread today. There is another problem with the regime's recent announcements. It is the height of hypocrisy to claim credit for permitting Cubans to own products that virtually none of them can afford. For the regime's actions to have any impact, they must be accompanied by major economic reforms that open up Cubans' inefficient state-run markets to give families real choices about what they buy, and institute a free enterprise system that allows ordinary people to benefit from their talents and their hard work. Only when Cubans have an economy that makes prosperity possible with these announcements lead to any real improvements in their daily lives. Real change in Cuba also requires political freedom. In this area, too, the regime has made grand commitments. One of Raul's first acts after receiving his new titles was to sign a major United Nations treaty on human rights. Yet when it comes to respecting human rights on the island. The regime has not attempted even cosmetic changes. For example, political dissidents continue to be harassed, detained, and beaten, and more than 200 prisoners of conscience still languish in Castro's tropical gulag. Recently, I received a letter from a man who spent 17 years in these dungeons. He described them as dens of torture and pain and death. This is an undeniable violation of the UN treaty that Cuba just signed. The regime views this document as anything more than a worthless piece of paper. It must immediately stop its abuse of political dissidents and release all political prisoners. Applause